Uh, Germany would soon be on everyone's mind, the beginning of page 15. For national elections in September 1930, Hitler's National Socialist Party received more than six million votes, becoming the second largest party in the country. So that is indeed uh, Hitler's party, National Socialist Party, nowadays often thought of as being conservative or right-wing for various reasons, mainly because of its opposition to communism. Uh, it's true that Hitler did see Bolshevism, communism, international socialism as the main enemy of national socialism, but because it wasn't German, because it was international and therefore a threat to his system, not because of any fundamental ideological disagreement. Uh, it's really, really the same thing. So in other words, Nazis are also leftists. They're socialists. It's quite literally in the name, National Socialist Party. And as we'll see, far from kindly to the church as well. We touched upon that last year during the reign of, uh, we're looking at Pius XI. We're actually still looking at the reign of Pius XI here. Uh, we'll be covering, if not today, then sometime soon. And some things that uh, I wanted to cover last year during the, for the reign of Pius XI under the title of studying that reign specifically, which we didn't get to cover. So we'll be looking at some of that uh, shortly, if not today, then in the very near future. But uh, in September 1930, Hitler's National Socialist Party becomes the second largest in the country, uh, democratically elected as such. Amid Germany's severe economic depression with widespread unemployment, government paralysis, and powerful socialist and communist movements, it had formerly seemed inconceivable that the Nazis would come to power, or even could, that this was, a, that this was anywhere in the realm of possibility was no longer a laughing matter. So remember, these conditions were very much brought about by that Versailles Treaty, which uh, Benedict XV, Pope Benedict XV, who was reigning at the time, uh, disliked, uh, saw it as being a terrible idea. Uh, then at the, at the time, Nuncio to Germany, Pacelli, thought was terrible. Cardinal Gaspari, thought was terrible. Uh, even nations who had been on the side fighting against Germany, the United States, the United Kingdom, uh, were not of the, uh, their leaders, Woodrow Wilson, as terrible as he was, David Lloyd George, uh, they were not so, uh, they were not so keen on punishing Germany so terribly. But it was the enormous war reparations that were imposed upon Germany that led to its economic depression uh, and all of the other troubles that came from that. Uh, for also the, the the shutting down of the of the German uh, monarchy was uh, cr created a power vacuum that allowed all of this, these socialist and communist movements to rise up to begin with. So recognizing in the Nazi movement a pagan threat to the faith in Germany, Pius XI looked on with concern. You may remember we touched upon last year his encyclical Mit Brennender Zorga with burning anxiety, addressing various aspects of of Nazi ideology. And indeed, there are uh, strong elements of paganism uh, within Nazism. For example, even the, the very the famous symbol of the SS, that's a repurposed pagan symbol. It's just pagan through and through. And yes, there, there were, of course, Catholics living in Germany, many Catholics, and we'll see that. And we'll see how the, the Nazis very much followed the pattern of, of previous German persecutors of the church in dealing with the Catholics and the large numbers of Catholics living in Germany. And there were Catholics in the, in the German army, but there it was the SS. Uh, Hitler boasted how many of his the SS divisions were churchless, use the German term, obviously. But he boasted about how many of his divisions, SS divisions, were churchless. So Catholics were allowed into the regular army, but not into the SS. Certainly not Germans. So, uh, signs soon appeared of the catastrophe that was about to befall Europe. So, this was a long time in coming. And arguably, uh, if, that, if that was a true quote from Marshall Foch, that this is only a 20-year armistice, well, that uh, 20 years was, was ticking, or ticking by rapidly at this point. So, while Mussolini kept a bust of Napoleon in his study, 
Adolf Hitler, who became Chancellor of Germany in January 1933, had long kept a bust of Benito Mussolini in his. So, quite literally his idol on his desk. The Duce was his role model. He said before, even to the point of taking his title. Führer is German for leader. Duce is Italian for leader. So, il Duce der Führer, this meaning the same thing in two different languages. So shortly after his swearing-in ceremony, Hitler sent Mussolini a message. Fascism and Nazism had much in common. He hoped to strengthen ties between the two countries. So Mussolini basked in the flattery, but still had doubts about his, well, his acolyte, someone who was very subservient to him. Hitler was a dreamer, better suited to fiery speechifying than to governing. As for Hermann Goering, he was an ex-inmate of a lunatic asylum which is actually true. <laughs> Does anybody know who Hermann Goering was? Yes. Wasn't he the, I guess, the superior general of the, S of the Wehrmacht? He was the Luftwaffe boss, the German Air Force boss, who was actually, uh, interestingly enough, a, a, a former ace pilot from the First World War. In the, in the First World War, aircraft didn't play such a decisive role, but they, they, they became uh, pilots became something of uh, the, the, the modern equivalent of knights in armor. They would, uh, they, would start, they would start fighting with each other above the sky. In the skies above the trenches, the people would watch them, and they became celebrities almost. Uh, some of them are very famous. For example, the Red Baron on the German side during the First World War was the top ace. In other words, killed, made the most kills, as I understand from anybody on either side, but that's, that's really outside of or definitely outside of what we're talking about here. Uh, but Goering was in that class of elite pilots and uh, eventually became the Luftwaffe boss under Hitler. But he was, yes, an ex-inmate of a lunatic asylum. Also uh, an electric train enthusiast, apparently, <laughs> which is really completely irrelevant, but it's somewhat amusing. Nonetheless, both Mussolini believed suffered from inferiority complexes. So Mussolini doesn't have any personal use for Hitler or any of his uh, fellow thugs, but he definitely has use for, well, honestly, more and more, he'll come to rely actually on, on German uh, strength, uh, military strength, etc., uh, increasingly, and co conferring with them increasingly on various things. So Hitler is a genial agitator, said Cardinal Pacelli, but it is too early to tell if he is a man of government. High-ranking members of the hierarchy of the church in Germany had long been wary of Hitler. But the Nazi leader, aware that one of, out of three Germans was Catholic, was eager to win Vatican support. Just as Italy's Catholic Popular Party had stood in Mussolini's way, Germany's Catholic Center Party stood in Hitler's. So we saw last year what happened to that uh, popular party, the po pa Partito Popolare, and its uh, founder, Louis, Don Luigi Sturzo. It was eventually shut down. Sturzo was forced to resign, uh, or pressured, heavily pressured to resign, which he finally did. The, the Partito Popolare was shut down as a kind of a deal between Pius XI and Mussolini. If you shut down this popular party, uh, then we will make certain concessions to the church. Don Sturzo has to be out of the picture, etc. All of that was granted. Uh, and. Perhaps it got certain things for the church, but uh, obviously the clash between Pius XI and Mussolini didn't just end there. But now uh, we have a similar situation in Germany. This Catholic center party uh, is a similar obstacle to Hitler. So less than a month after Hitler came to power, the German ambassador assured Pacelli that the new chancellor wanted good relations with the Holy See. After all, the ambassador pointed out, Hitler was a Catholic which is actually, yes, he was at least born a Catholic, and he was actually Austrian. That's uh, something that's it's interesting to keep in mind, that Hitler was actually born in Austria. That he was, in fact, rejected by the Austrian army at a certain point, and so he went to serve in the German army instead. And that's how he ended up as a, as a corporal in the German army. Uh, in fact, as, a, as I understand, a, a, a messenger on the front, which was an extremely dangerous job, actually. But that's, that was his job during the First World War. But Hitler was not exactly a, a good practicing Catholic at this point. 
uh, and uh, affect them. Yeah, uh, obviously, heading a threat to the church, or a, th a threat to the well-being of the church, we'll say, in Germany at this point. So the, the Pope, too, uh, had doubts about the Nazis. With the Hitlerites in power, Pius XI asked the previous spring, what could one hope for? But within weeks of Hitler's appointment, he began to have a more positive view. I have changed my opinion of Hitler, he told the surprised French ambassador in early March. It is the first time that such a government voice has been raised to denounce Bolshevism in such categorical terms, joining with the voice of the Pope. As we've touched upon, not for the same motives as for which the church condemns socialism. Obviously not. Uh, the church condemns socialism because of its ideological problems. Hitler had certain issues with Bolshevism but, or with, with communism, but not, in a sense, not the right ones. Again, we said before, uh, it wasn't German. It was international, not national, and therefore a threat to his model. And also, it is true that uh, the Nazis espoused certain conservative items, such as the family. They, 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 they did, in a sense, put the family on a pedestal. And that appealed to certain conservative elements, obviously. And here, clearly, Pius XI, in saying this, is looking to Hitler as, okay, someone denounced, denouncing Bolshevism. Here is a, an enemy of our enemy, uh, to that extent, a friend. But clearly not to any greater extent than that. Uh, for example, uh, Finland, during the war that's coming, uh, was allied with Germany. But they are little faulted, if at all, for having been allied with Germany because they were also at war. In fact, they had been invaded very aggressively by Russia first. And Germany happened to be also and entered later into war against Russia. And so they ended up uh, with a common goal, defeat, uh, defeat the Red Army. So here it's a similar thing. Uh, not, not clearly. Uh, it's, it's not a question of giving any kind of approval to Nazism, to its regime, to its ideology, or anything like that. But okay, well, here's somebody who's denouncing something that's, that's still worse, a still greater monster at any rate, uh, the, the communist Russia at this point. So the Pope was eager to reach an understanding with the Nazi government that would protect their church's influence in Germany. And so you see, given the, the history of the entire history of the church, just dealing with whatever regime is there, trying to set up whatever we can to, just so we can operate and provide as much as we possibly can for the good of souls. To have, uh, to whatever extent we possibly can, a functioning apostolate in that nation. That's what the church is always going for. Anybody who's willing to argue will, will listen. Remember arguing, have it, St. Pius XI repeatedly having Pacelli as the nuncio to Germany as part of really a, a secret mission there as the secret aspect of his mission there, to try to negotiate something with the Soviet ambassador in Berlin. Quiet, doing it quietly, even secretly, but still just trying to work out something. Ultimately, that was unsuccessful. But he thinks, OK, well, maybe, maybe Hitler is a little bit more reasonable here. We can, we can argue with him. We can negotiate with him, which is exactly what he ends up doing, sending uh, Cardinal Pacelli to work this out who, as an able negotiator, which we saw, remember, he was able to work out something with the Soviet government at one point. It, it ended up uh, not falling through, but he worked out something with the, the Soviet government. Uh, in this case, he sees the center party as one of the Holy See's major bargaining chips, so to speak. By offering to end church support for the party, he believed the Vatican could extract guarantees protecting the rights of Catholic associations in Germany. Before he could reach a deal with Hitler, though, the party announced its own dissolution. Rather than suffering that, they decided just, we'll just disband. But you see here again, uh, Pacelli's uh, idea, well, we, we can solve these problems by means of diplomacy. We can, we can cut some kind of a deal. We can, we can keep things calm, keep things nice. Uh, some, um, smooth, smooth it over somehow. Maybe, yes, we don't like these people, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll work out something with them. And in fact, he was one who we've seen by now has spearheaded such efforts repeatedly. In July, Cardinal Pacelli escorted the German Vice Chancellor Franz von Papen into his Vatican apartment. 
The Concordat they signed there guaranteed the church in Germany the right to manage its own affairs and offered various protections for priests, religious orders, and church property. So clearly, uh, this, um, and certainly in the mind of Cardinal Pacelli, really vindicates this idea. Look, look what we got as a result of this. But much of its language, particularly that dealing with Catholic associations and schools, was vague. And we'll see problems arising from that. But at the same time that they signed the Concordat, the Nazis introduced their law for the prevention of hereditarily diseased offspring, which mandated the forced sterilization of those deemed defective, in clear opposition to the moral doctrines of the church. So at the one hand, Nazis are signing this Concordat, and the other, they're passing that law. So immediately, there are further issues. So Hitler also began moving against the church's network of parochial schools. So see that those that that ambiguity left in the in that concordat is now coming back uh, to cause problems. The Nazis wanted a church they could fully control. And uh, remember, in this, uh, the Nazis are very much along the same lines as uh, Bismarck, whom in fact they, in a sense, worshipped. Uh, remember Bismarck. In, we covered it last year, uh, in, embarked on his Kulturkampf for the purpose of creating a national German church that was acceptable both to Catholics and Protestants. So in, the, in, in Prussia, in the, you know, in the German Empire, there were many Catholics, and the idea was to, uh, to control everything, and uh, they could see Bismarck, Otto von Bismarck, the German chancellor at the time, effectively the one running things, in, the, in, in Prussia, in the German Empire, uh, recognized that without religious unity, there, there will not be any kind of lasting national unity. And so he wanted to put together a, a, a national church that was acceptable both to Catholics and Protestants. It was an utter failure, ultimately, and we saw that. But the Nazis are thinking very much along similar lines here. Uh, they see the same problems uh, for them, for, the, for themselves, that Bismarck saw for the, the empire when he was in control. And they're seeking similar, uh, similar solutions, uh, obviously instead of converting to their Catholic faith and encouraging everybody else to do the same, uh, they're seeking instead to control the church, to control all the Catholics in, in the, uh, within their borders. <clears throat> so in early fall, the Vatican Secretary of State Office, which remember uh, Pacelli is at the head of, produced an alarming analysis of these efforts. Uh, the efforts put, uh, produced, put forward by the Nazis in order to control the church fully. So the analysis included a text of a song popular in the Hitler Youth calling Hitler their redeemer. In October, the editor of Italy's most prominent Catholic newspaper, La Venire d'Italia, meaning the future of Italy, warned that the Nazis were working toward a German national church in which Protestants and Catholics are mixed together, which is precisely the goal of Bismarck. And remember that you know, Nazis practically worshipped him. You may remember that they named their huge battleship the Bismarck, as in the Bismarck that went up against the MHS hood and was eventually scuttled. But that was their big battleship when they started rebuilding their navy in defiance of the Versailles Treaty. They named their big battleship after, after Bismarck. And remember, their ideas, not only that, not only did they revere Bismarck as the one who forged the German Empire, but you may remember the quote from Bismarck saying that Prussia was destined, or to the effect that Prussia is destined to, to dominate Germany, and then Germany is destined to dominate the world. And this can only happen by means of steel and blood. That was, that was Bismarck's idea. And clearly the Nazis liked that, liked the sound of that. And uh, Bismarck indeed employed steel a great deal, shed a great deal of blood uh, working towards that end. And you know, obviously the Nazis did the same. So following in the very worst traditions of the persecutors of the church, the Nazis, in just about every way here. And I'll say they follow all the usual steps, all the usual steps that we've seen uh, uh, foisted on the church by all kinds of other leftist governments everywhere else. In December, 
In his annual Christmas address to the Cardinals, Pius XI voiced his disappointment with the Nazi government. Pacelli and von Papen had signed the Concordat only five months earlier. While the Pope's doubts about Hitler were growing, those closest to him were trying to keep relations as harmonious as possible. In early 1934, both Cardinal Pacelli and the Papal Nuncio to Germany, Monsignor Cesare Orsenigo, cautioned the Pope against saying anything that would anger Hitler, lest it further undermine the Church's position. So you see here again Pacelli. We, we saw this last year when we were focusing mainly on Pius XI. Now we're looking at all of this. Everything that's come before really we're establishing just to have a general context, but also specifically to look at how Cardinal Pacelli views these, these problems, these, these admittedly difficult situations, and what he sees as, as the solution to them. Let's not rock the boat. That is his constant policy. Let's not rock the boat which makes sense in this, uh, that he should take that position given his diplomatic training. And it's not to say that diplomacy never has a place, ever. Uh, but we'll see the extent to which he takes this, future Pius XII, as Pope. So worried about anti-Catholic elements in the Nazi movement, the Pope was especially upset about a book entitled The Myth of the 20th Century, written by Alfred Rosenberg, the Nazi's foremost theoretician. Rosenberg argued that God created humans as separate races, that the superior Aryan race was destined to rule over the others. And he asserted that Jesus was an Aryan, but that the Jewish apostles had polluted, even using the term bastardized, his teachings. Okay, this is the foremost Nazi theoretician. Actually, Hitler himself eventually distanced himself from this book because it was just so obviously crazy and disgusting and offensive to that to the church with, you know, he's trying to come to some understanding with the church himself catholicism in rosenberg's mind was the uh, uh, adulterated or you know, he's, this is the part of which he used the term bastardized product of jewish influence yeah this is how the nazis viewed the catholic church and the catholic faith not exactly in a friendly manner to put it as nicely as possible in early 1934 the Holy Office placed this German bestseller on the Index of Forbidden Books, which hopefully comes as a surprise to exactly nobody. <laughs> right, all that's going on in 1934, remember, uh, was when the, well, the, the president of the Weimar Republic died and Hitler just placed himself in that place. Does anybody know who that was, that previous president of the Weimar Republic who died in 1934? That was the Paul, Paul von Hindenburg remember was the uh, one of the heroes of the Battle of Tannenberg in Prussia that was that was a, a, a battle an early battle early in, in the First World War 1914 in which the Germans just annihilated the Russian forces sent against them just destroyed them completely and actually took the opportunity to name the battle the Battle of Tannenberg because there was a, a battle oops, uh, which had taken place there was a battle which had taken place centuries earlier in which the Teutonic Knights had been defeated, which had been known as the Battle of Tannenberg. So they decided to transfer the name from a German defeat to a, a German victory, and, and they, were, they were successful in that, if nothing else. Um, now you see the Battle of Tannenberg, you think, uh, oh yes, the Germans annihilated the Russians in that, in that battle, uh, and, as indeed they did. So it was an early sign of what was coming for Russia any time they would cross, clash arms with the, with the Germans. But that was how Paul von Hindenburg and also you know, General Ludendorff was there, uh, and it was that was there that was how they really set themselves up as German national heroes. That eventually led to uh, Hindenburg, or Ludendorff becoming uh, quartermaster general, from which position, with his uh, with his uh, say collaborator uh, Paul von Hindenburg as chief of the German general staff, that they. And effectively, Ludendorff, uh, most especially, ran the country, ran the nation, uh, you might even say into the ground uh, uh, during the First World War. But uh, after, after the war, Ludendorff got all involved with the Nazis. There are the photographs of him posing with, standing next to Hitler. Uh, and, uh, but Hindenburg was the one who, uh, he, he still remained the poster boy, so to speak, and was eventually elected the president of the Weimar Republic. And he died in, and it was under his 
uh, and during his presidency that Hitler rose to the chancellorship. And when Paul von Hindenburg died in 1934, Hitler just inserted himself into the position of president as well. And at that point, no, nobody complained about it, at least uh, not in any significant numbers. He just, you know, he was in control at that point. So all of that's happening. Mussolini's ambitions and ego were growing ever larger. He wanted to be seen as the man who restored Rome to its ancient grandeur. And for that, a new empire was needed. So his sights turned to Ethiopia, or otherwise at the time called Abyssinia, which aside from Liberia was the only part of Africa not already in European hands. So this is Mussolini's idea of rebuilding the Roman Empire. Let's go conquer a part of, 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 of Africa, Abyssinia, now generally called Ethiopia, but that was his idea. Which, remember, had been tried once before in the 1890s, and the Italians had been defeated by the Ethiopians. So it wasn't exactly a stellar success the first time this was tried, but he is going for it again. Of course, he wasn't in power when that first attempt was made, but he's going for this. He's going for round two, which indeed results, and we'll see this, but not in detail, but this results in the second Italo-Ethiopian War. And, uh, well, Ethiopia has certain advantages. For one thing, uh, it's bordered by two Italian colonies, Italian Somaliland, now part of Somalia, and Eritrea on its borders. So the, the Duce had already hinted at his intentions. In late 1934, Ethiopian forces had fired on a group of Italian soldiers well across the border from Italian Somaliland. And Mussolini, this is exactly what he wanted. He threatened war unless Ethiopia apologized and offered compensation. So with much fanfare, that's typical, he sent several armies to Somalia and a fleet of ships to the Red Sea, telling them to await further instructions. So Pius XI was far from happy. For one thing, it's obviously an aggression, just a, a war of conquest here. is obvious to everybody. Wars of conquest are seldom, if ever, justified. It's one thing if, in, in, as part of the settlement, uh, the peace treaty of a just war, that the victorious nation should require certain territorial concessions. But to embark upon a war simply for the purpose of conquest is almost guaranteed, almost guaranteed to be an unjust war. I wouldn't go, go to so far as say it's in every single case ever that that, that is true, but. As a, as a general, if not exactly universal rule, that is the case. So Pius XI is far from happy at seeing this. Also, uh, this potentially, he worries, will put at, um, at risk uh, Catholic missionary work throughout Africa. So in early September 1935, the biggest joke ever, that is the League of Nations, met to discuss the possibility that Italy would invade Ethiopia, a member state. So the League of Nations was yes, exactly that, a joke from the very beginning. Uh, it was, does anybody know whose idea that was to begin with, this League of Nations? Yes. Woodrow Wilson? Yes, Woodrow Wilson's idea. And uh, the irony of it all was that the United States Senate refused to enter into it. So from the beginning, it was crippled. <laughs> the man who, whose idea it was couldn't get his own nation to be part of it. And his, uh, uh, Wilson's attempts to to try to get the U.S. Senate to, to agree to it were just uh, yeah, entirely unsuccessful, to put, it, to put it mildly, entirely unsuccessful. And so it was crippled from the beginning. Uh, but that was the idea. At the time, this, this international league, this almost a tribunal that would decide all kinds of disputes. And we'll see just how effective it was. Uh, spoiler alert, the answer is absolutely not at all. So, that's where they met. They met in September 1935 when it became clear that uh, Mussolini was going to invade Abyssinia, uh, as indeed he did in October. So should Mussolini do so, the League threatened, it would impose severe economic sanctions, which clearly Mussolini could not have cared less about. Cardinal Pacelli and Monsignor Pizzardo tried to persuade the Pope to keep his opposition to Mussolini's war to himself because in Pius XI, very fiery personality. We'll see that in, in some detail. We'll look at some anecdotes of, of to the, uh, just to what extent that could manifest itself when he, and Pius XI chose to make it clear how unhappy he was about something. But also here, again, Cardinal Pacelli 
pulling back Pius XI from saying anything. Certainly from coming out swinging, but even perhaps from saying anything at all. If he, if the only thing he could manage, if the only things he could manage to say, were undiplomatic. So, on September 13th, Pacelli sent word to Mussolini that the Pope would not stand stand in the way of an invasion. So he got that at least. He got that from Pius. Let's, let's just, if they're going to do it, let's just not say anything about it. When Germany's ambassador, Diego von Bergen, entered the Pope's library in, in early 1936, he feared the encounter would be uncomfortable. It was Pius XI's custom to meet with every ambassador at the New Year. In the ten minutes allocated to each, he offered his blessing and briefly bestowed praise or blame for the government's recent actions, so the government represented by the particular ambassador. As it happened, Bergen's meeting would turn out to be even more unpleasant than uh, he had expected. The Pope had much to complain about, and we see that though he was not uh, complaining without justification by any means. In 1933, when Hitler came to power, two-thirds of all schoolchildren in Munich, capital of Germany's largest Catholic region, Bavaria, had been attending Catholic parochial schools. By 1935, this number had been cut in half. In another two years, it would shrink to 3%. You see the amount of trouble, clearly, the Nazis are causing for the church in Germany. So shouting, this is, yeah, here, here's Pius XI's natural inclinations shining through, shouting and waving his arms and becoming even more agitated, Pius XI bemoaned all of the ways the Third Reich was persecuting the church. Again, this is another, just the very name Third Reich is another manifestation of the Nazis' admiration and imitation of Bismarck. And he forged the Second Reich, so there they forged the Third. Now the first was the, actually the Holy Roman Empire. So the Holy Roman Empire gave the church trouble as well, even though it was, we can go into the whole history of that, but it was actually set up to be a protection for the church. And that, that's for another period. So it gets worse every time. Uh, when Bergen attempted to get a word in, the Pope simply raised his voice further. Now, Pius XI was famous for this, by the way. He was famous for yelling at people, to have, taking people to the office, just screaming at them like this. That was his personality. And you see, at any time in which he practices forbearance, it's Cardinal Pacelli pulling him back. So there have always been those who have said that the church is destined to disappear. He, Pius XI, warned the ambassador. But it is they who have always disappeared, not the church. And that's, that, that is 100% true, what he said right there. Uh, may, you may remember that Napoleon effectively tried to bring about the end of the church. He tried to disperse the cardinals so that they could not come together to elect a new pope. But you may also remember that by the time Napoleon died in exile, practically by himself, well, there were a few people there. It's said there was a priest at his deathbed, though it's unclear whether he converted or not, whether he made his peace with, with the church and with God before passing away, which may have been due to poisoning. But whatever, whatever the case, he dies in exile, if not in comp completely by himself, almost by himself, and the island of, of St. Helena in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, while Pius VII, Pope Pius VII, whom he had persecuted, had under house arrest, uh, given so much trouble to for so many years, was reigning still gloriously in Rome, uh, over, presiding over the restoration of the uh, pre-revolutionary monarchies in Europe. That was, that was the idea at the time. That uh, was the restoration period, early, er, post-Napoleon, uh, but in those, uh, those succeeding decades in the uh, uh, still per first half of the 19th century, that was the restoration period. And the Bourbons were back in power in France, uh, and this was, you know, just, okay, we're, we're putting all that ugliness behind us. Napoleon was very much a part of the revolution. So that is just one example of that, and he made some comment, Napoleon made some comment on his deathbed to the effect that uh, uh, priest thou hast conquered, or something like that, referring to Pius VII. You can find his exact words, but he said something to that effect. And it was, it's obvious, yes, just look at, looking at the, the fact of the situation, what the, sit, the world situation was, uh, this, this, the state, the situation of the papacy, 
as well as all of Western Europe at the time of Napoleon's death. Uh, that's just one illustration, a relatively recent one, uh, of what Pius XI is saying here. So with those words, the Pope pressed the electric buzzer he had, had installed on his desk, beckoning the attendant outside to open the door for his departing visitor. So he kicks him out of his office after that. Bergen went directly to Cardinal Pacelli's office to complain. He regarded, the, he regarded the former German nuncio as an old friend. How much of what the Pope said, he asked, should he pass on to his superiors? The Pope's harsh words, he pointed out, would anger them. Pacelli recommended that he report only the gist of the Pope's comments, leaving out his more inflammatory remarks. So this is, we saw this last year in, in, other, in other areas as well, that uh, Pacelli would pull things back. You may remember that uh, when Pius XI died uh, on the eve of giving what was supposed to be a, a speech uh, denouncing Mussolini and all of his racial laws and everything, his marriage laws, that uh, Pius XI died before giving that speech, Cardinal Pacelli went and, and grabbed the text of that speech. This episode has shown yet again, Bergen would tell the German foreign minister, how Cardinal Pacelli constantly strives to pacify and to exert a moderating influence on the Pope, who is difficult to manage and to influence. Pacelli was one of those few, apparently, who were able to, to do that, to influence Pius XI. And we'll see, yes, that this would always be Pius XII's uh, modus operandi, we can say. Uh, keeping things pacified as much as possible. The Duce's increasing embrace of the Fuhrer angered the Pope, angered Pius XI. Nor was he happy that Britain and France were doing so little to stop Germany's military buildup. So, indeed, Germany was, under Hitler, was remilitarizing. They were just dis completely disregarding all of the uh, restrictions of the Versailles Treaty, which were, indeed, very harsh. Uh, very, very restrictive indeed, but uh, which still they, they signed on too willingly or not at the end of that war. And Pius XI did enunciate that at a certain point. He didn't name any names, but he did mention in one of his encyclicals that you're not free just to disregard a treaty that you've signed. And everybody knew what he was referring to. He didn't name names, but everyone knew what he was referring to. And Germany was indeed disregarding that. So it started building battleships which were much bigger, such as the Bismarck, started, uh, they, they brought back their air force, uh, and all in complete defiance of the treaty, and nobody did anything about it. For one thing, France just didn't have a stomach for another war with Germany. Uh, they were, they, they were uh, all effectively knocked out of the first one. And Britain was, as we saw before from the start, not so keen on punishing Germany that heavily, and, and even, even when Hitler started annexing various pieces of territory, uh, the British didn't protest too much, if at all, but the idea that uh, it's not so unreasonable that they should want those areas back. So uh, Britain and France were, had no stomach for another fight with Germany, and really uh, no, no stomach for another confrontation, we should say, at this point. And so they didn't do much, if at all, if anything at all. So on March 7th, 1936, Hitler sent German military forces into the Rhineland, the strip of land at the border of France, Belgium, and the Netherlands, that, according to the 1919 Versailles Treaty, was to remain demilitarized. This is common practice um, when you have hostile nations bordering one another to have a demilitarized zone. Nobody puts any military personnel or hardware in this area here. We'll have this as a buffer zone in order to avoid the the, the possibility of incidents at the border. That's the idea. The demilitarized zones, of course, remain in existence to this day in various places. So, uh, uh, the Germans are just violating every aspect of their limitations of that 1919 treaty. The German troops had orders to retreat at the first sign of counterattack by the French, but the French did nothing. Indeed, at this point, you may know of the famous Maginot line that they were building on their border with Germany, which was a uh, um, series of, of uh, reinforced concrete bunkers going, spanning many miles. Uh, they were getting ready for another German attack, potentially, and they didn't particularly uh, have the stomach for it. 
So the, uh, if you had sent, there should be 200,000 men. If you had sent in 200,000 men, the Pope told the French ambassador the following week, you would have rendered an immense service to the world. But they weren't going to do that. Europe moved one step closer to war. Also, events in Spain were leading to greater collaboration between the Duce and Hitler. This is one thing, we don't have much time now, we'll go into it in uh, subsequent classes, but uh, this is one thing that I didn't get to cover last year during the reign of Pius XI that we'll look at now, and that is the Spanish Civil War, which was, uh, it, brought, it brings together everything uh, here. We have well, persecution of the church by the, uh, the Spanish Republican government. We have an uprising, of the, uh, you have the persecution of the church, and then you have uh, everybody getting involved in it to a certain degree. So all, all, all the stuff, all the nations we've been considering and the church's dealings with them, they all get involved in this to the, to the point that it really was, uh, it's, it's often looked upon as a dress rehearsal for the Second World War. And we'll see that. So I well, won't you know, have time to go into the details of it right now, but uh, an electoral victory by Spain's leftist popular front in the spring of 1936 triggered a military rebellion. And that was indeed what uh, Francisco Franco's attack on the Republican government was. That was, uh, a, it was, a, it was an army revolt against what was, admittedly, uh, absolutely no, no doubt about it, that it was a, a sickening regime, horrible in every way. In fact, its, uh, its emblem was, uh, 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 had, the, had the very same words as, the, as that of the, the French Revolution. It had those same words in Spanish, but liberty, fraternity, equality had those same, exact same words in Spanish. Uh, so it's, uh, it was the exact same thing. They're, they were explicitly revolutionary and, uh, and uh, uh, persecuting the church. And we'll see some of that. It gets even worse once the war begins. But Spain had worried the Pope ever since the king's abdication five years earlier. So this was uh, King Alfonso XIII. Spain. Does anybody know anything interesting about him in particular? Well, there are probably many interesting things, but one in particular had to do with the, 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 the date of the beginning of his reign. He was born king because his father had died before he was born, so as soon as he was born, he was the king. And then until, until he abdicated. <laughs> From his birth till the time that he abdicated, he was the king of Spain. Uh, his mother was regent for him, until he came of age, but he was, uh, he had no time as crown prince. But he abdicated, and that was when there, the official Republican government was established. Uh, in 1933, the Pope issued an encyclical criticizing the Spanish government's encroachments on the rights of the church. Among other steps, the government introduced new public controls over church property, evicted Jesuits from the country, and then to the involvement of the religious orders in public education. So not, not the first time that the Jesuits had been evicted from Spanish domains, uh, but the latest one. And uh, yeah, just following all the usual steps of persecuting the church. Yet Pius XI was still inclined to work with the more moderate government elements to find a solution, as always. And clearly he has in mind that which is really obvious to everybody who understands that the church is a divinely instituted society, the church will outlast all of these regimes. They, human regimes come and go. The church will never die. As the Pius XI put it, the church will never disappear. And those who have desired its disappearance have themselves disappeared. So he, the idea is work something out. If at all possible, we'll work, so, we'll work out something here for the good of souls. That is the constant idea. The outbreak of the Civil War in July 1936 brought unspeakable horrors. Even before the war, as early as 1934, dozens of priests, brothers, and seminarians were killed by leftists in Asturias, northwestern Spain, in what may be looked upon as the beginning of the Red Terror, which became still worse in the course of the war. And during that course, 700 priests, monks, and nuns were killed. Priests' ears were cut off and passed around as if they were trophies from a bullring. Nuns' rotting remains were dug up from their graves and left exposed. French newspapers published photographs. Monasteries were transformed into socialist headquarters, 
religious services were banned, and almost all of Barcelona's church were set ablaze. All of the churches were set ablaze in Barcelona, almost all of them. And on August 12th, Cardinal Pacelli went to the Spanish embassy to protest. So clearly, uh, if Pacelli decides we can't negotiate with this, this is just so bad it needs to be protested against, it's bad enough to protest against, for sure. That means that the limits of diplomacy have definitely been reached. <laughs>